Welcome to the Solution Point podcast and YouTube channel, uh, where we answer your solution. We provide you with solutions to your problems with life and the law and business. So uh, I have, as usual, my uh, co-host and producer Catalina Dickerson. Hi, everybody. Now today I have a uh, we have a really special guest, a, a dear friend of mine, uh, Charles Laputka. He's an, uh, a real estate and finance attorney from Pennsylvania, and if I read his bio, it would I'd, I'd be here for the entire time. So we won't <laughs> go go into too much in detail, but he he practices in the financial and real estate uh, with with a special focus in uh, bankruptcy. And he's, he handles cases all throughout uh, Pennsylvania. So if you're in that area and you need, you need help and you need somebody who cares about, about you, their clients, Charles is definitely the person to, to, to go to. That's, that's the one thing that, that, that's really important, especially in this uh, practice area, is somebody who cares about their clients. There's so many people who, who basically, you're just a file and a number, and, and Charles really handles his business in, 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 a, in a very uh, nurturing way. Uh, and then one more thing that I uh, that I, I can't neglect to add because family is very important to us. Uh, he's he's married to his beautiful bride, who I have only met uh, online, uh, <laughs> and they have uh, two daughters, eleven and thirteen, and they have a son who's going to be twenty two this summer. Uh, That's my right. Son, my my son will be twenty two uh, this month, so uh, we- just a little ahead of you on that. But without further ado, Charles, round tell of us. Applause. Yes, round of applause. So, so Charles, you know the 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 name of the game is Solution Point, and so here's where we we ask our 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 guests to provide a solution, you know that that they can share to 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 a problem dealing with business, life, or the law. Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me on the program. I'm I'm excited to be here, and uh, I wasn't sure how long of a bio you wanted, so I, I can see that I gave you more than necessary. But thank you for uh, the shout out to my wife and children. They'll be happy to know, uh, you know. And this is this is we're doing this for them, right? We we get up every day and go to work and help the families that we help, so that we can provide for our own family. So that's always very important and near and dear to my heart. And just like you said, uh, Mike, I treat basically we treat all of our employees here like family and our clients as well, because that's, that's very important to me. Great. Well, Charles, maybe um, I'm sure you're going to give us a solution, but we may need maybe a little bit of an overview of the problem. And so here at the solution point, you know, we're going to of course dive into your solution, but give us a little bit about maybe something or your personal insight of a problem that is, you know, coming in that the solution you've created. Absolutely. So, you know, one of the the big things that's uh, occurring right now, and, and this happens all the time, it just happens to be very topical at the moment here in 2021 at the hopeful tail end of the COVID pandemic, but there are a lot of folks, small business owners and, you know, regular employees that have fallen behind on some of their bills, whether it be a mortgage or unsecured debt like credit cards or even things like student loans. Mm -hmm. And right now we're going through a lot of folks being behind on mortgages. And I think that's the problem that we really want to talk about today is how to get control of your finances, whether it's a result of COVID-19, because that happens to be the, the big thing that's going on right now, or just any job loss or injury or illness at any point in the future. I mean, this, this advice is not time sensitive, though the, the compounded problem is, is occurring right now. Right. So, you know, my my phone lines always ring and we get calls like I'm being sued by a credit card company or I just got a notice that my home's in foreclosure. You know, I lost my job or I'm self-employed and, you know, we just haven't had a lot of customers or a lot of clients lately and I haven't been able to make ends meet. So what we do is uh, we always offer a free consultation and we sit down with clients, uh, sometimes on Zoom, sometimes in person, and basically just 
take a look at the finances holistically. You know, okay. some people are, are, are trying to hold on to a house that they really could never have afforded to begin with. And, and they've been struggling and they've been house poor for years. And sometimes the solution is to figure out a way to eliminate that debt and, and move forward, maybe downsize house or move to a different area. And you know, some folks have a temporary loss of income and now they're back on track because they lost a job for six months or what have you, or maybe they were downsized by their employer and they fell behind, but they still have the ability, if they tighten their belts a little bit and buckle down, they still have the ability to, to maintain their home or, or their car if their car is out for repossession, things of that nature. Right, and you, you mentioned, Probably a, a problem within a problem. Uh, the the problem of you know if they can just buckle down, if they can just you know uh, basically change their behavior. Do you sometimes see that that might is sometimes the biggest problem for folks to overcome? And and maybe give us some insight on that. Yeah, it absolutely can be. And one of the reasons that, you know, when somebody asks me what type of attorney I am, I basically say real estate and finance, because if you say bankruptcy, that puts you in a hole that people don't want to talk about. It's a, it's a dirty word. And I don't want people to think that that's their only option. So one of the things that we do is provide other options. Bankruptcy really should be a last resort, uh, Kat. And if you if you sometimes if you get back on track with income and you just buckle down and look at where you're spending things, you know, some people have $250 cable bills, right? I mean, that's that's certainly not unheard of. And there are a lot of ways that you can reduce that to a hundred dollars without losing a lot of programming or or outrageous cell phone bills because they have too many lines on their plan, or you know, one of uh, one of the things that I see with relative frequency frequency is gambling. You know, a lot of people are gambling, thinking that the next big hit will get them back on track. And they never sat down to do a budget to see if I just stop gambling, you know, I, maybe I don't need to, to gamble a hundred to try and make 300. Maybe if I just save that hundred, I can get back on track in, in a shorter amount of time. That makes sense. Or there's always the infamous uh, Starbucks habit too. You know, yeah. two two frappuccinos a day is uh, more expensive almost than smoking cigarettes, which is another another expensive habit. Yeah, and I mean, speaking of well, cappuccinos, and this is just a sidebar. I don't know how your Starbucks is. Of course, we've got you know one or two Starbucks, but the most popular one is in the most unopportune parking lot in a grocery store. But it does not stop anybody from wrapping around. And I said, "How good is that coffee? It must right. be really damn good." So yeah, that's a that's a it's a advices. You know, it sounds like you know where where people are choosing you know, their vices other than like that buckle down method. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I know uh, Mike has written a book, uh, you know, the, the three bucket method about savings. And I, I think that this conversation goes, uh, goes on with that a lot, you know, teaching people how to restructure their finances and save money can keep you out of bankruptcy. I mean, uh, bankruptcy is always an available option if you need it, but the whole idea is to try and stay away from it. Right. 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 And, and, I, and I guess uh, part of the part of the thing is uh, coming to, to face the mirror. I think that's that's one of the hard things is uh, sometimes we have a problem that, you know, landed on our lap like, you know, a, like COVID, for example. Uh, but then other times we have a problem that we that we grew from from a little puppy and we've grown it into this great Dane that that's eating our lunch. Uh, because we're 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 not paying attention to the numbers that are going out, and and our margins get thinner and thinner, and we don't we don't go back and look at it because we don't want to look in the mirror and say, hey, I have a car that I that that's more than than I can than than I can afford comfortably. I have a house that's that that's in a neighborhood that is maybe more than I need to, but. I, I can't downgrade my car because what are the neighbors going to think? I can't downgrade right. my house because then what are my what are my my in laws going to think? You know, so so you you wind up putting yourself in into this box that 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 if you don't take take action now, you could wind up having action taken for you with a foreclosure or a vehicle repossession, you know, or or things like that. 
Right. And keeping up with keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak, is a very big problem with the American dream. Um, you know, everybody wants to have their white picket fence. And if the American dream stopped there and people just wanted a home to live in, then I think it's very attainable. But what happens is the new American dream is I want a white picket fence that's bigger than my neighbors. And I want a car that's nicer than my neighbors, or, or at least the same. And the reality is very few people earn enough money to have it all. Right. So it, it sometimes it's picking and choosing. Do you want a five hundred thousand dollar house because you can afford a five hundred? Maybe you can afford a five hundred thousand dollar house if you drive a Honda Civic or if you want to drive a Porsche. Maybe you don't buy a five hundred thousand dollar house or something. You know, there are things that are within reach, but, you know, you can't have everything. Most people can't have everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tom Brady, maybe he can have it all. But the rest of us have to pick and choose and make wise decisions so that we can live within our means. Yeah. Yeah. How do you use now you mentioned, you know, I'm not I'm not you're kind of flipping the coin here. You know, I'm not a bankruptcy attorney. I'm a real estate. I'm a financial attorney. So where does your what do you do with the real estate to kind of, you know, uh, change up their situations to get, change their perspective of what you can do for them? Oh, absolutely. I'll explain. So, you know, part of my practice is real estate. And what that means is people generally put that together with credit. So a lot of clients come to see me and they're in a situation where they would really like to buy a home. And that is another half of, of a business that I own called Imperial Abstract. It's a title and real estate transfer company and title insurance. But one of the things is, people that generally call me are calling because they're having trouble buying the home, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody that calls a realtor and says, I want to buy a house, calls a bank and says, I'd like a loan for a house. And if the answers are yes, 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 they don't come here, right? So I end up meeting with the people who called the bank and the bank said, well, you know, not yet. You've got to deal with a couple of these credit issues. Um, so that that's how that all works together. So it's not always bankruptcy. Sometimes people have debt utilization ratios that are a little too high. You know, a, a lot of folks think, well, I pay my bills on time every month for the last 15 years. I must have good credit, but they never sit down and actually take a look at their credit score until they go to buy a house. Mm -hmm. And then the, you know, the mortgage company might say, well, you need to pay down these credit cards. The way to have great credit is to, yes, to use your cards and pay them off every month, but there's something called utilization ratio that a lot of people don't know about. Utilization ratio is the balance between the available credit on your card and how much of it you're actually using. Okay. And to have great credit, you have to use less than 30% of what they offer you. So if you have a $10,000 limit on your card, not only do you want to pay it off frequently, but you really don't ever want to carry a balance over $3,000. And it's kind of counterintuitive to what we hear. You know, they think, well, I borrowed $8,000 and I pay it every month. So that means that I have good credit. No, that means you're a high credit risk because you have to use 80% of what they've offered you on a regular basis. Nobody wants to give you any more. You have to right. prove that you don't need it, right? The, the way to get loans is to not need them. If you don't need a loan, mm -hmm. banks will give them to you all day long. When you need a loan, that's when they give you a problem right. about, they, about they getting you They have saturated loan. credit, not good credit. Correct. Mm -hmm. So there's just more to it than, than paying on time. Right. Now, so, so tell us a little bit, I guess, about, so you, you know, you've got the situation where person's, you know, been out of work for, for, for a year and, you know, they're the, the, the hurdle to get back, get caught up maybe is too great for them to be able to work out. What, what are, what are the, the, the different options that, that they can go through? And I guess now we're, Hey, now we're at the last resort. What, what are, what are, what are some of those uh, situations? Like how do, wh what would help you decide? Yeah. Now it's time to, to take the, the nuclear option, so to speak, to, to, to take that last, last step that, that you'd have to take. Of course. Uh, so this will, uh, the bankruptcy portion of what I'm about to explain is true uh, across the country. 
Bankruptcy is primarily federal law. So when we get to that part of the option, I want everybody to know that that's the way it works across the country. But I want to speak specifically to Pennsylvania very quickly with regard to timelines, because in some states, a home can go you know, from missed payment to houses sold within three months. In Pennsylvania, we have more time than that, which is great because we have what's called a judicial foreclosure state, which means if you stop paying your mortgage, the bank has to sue you. There are other states that have non-judicial foreclosure where if you stop paying your mortgage, you, know, you have that in Texas, right? There you go. So maybe you can add what the timeline is, but if you stop paying your mortgage in Texas, the bank can just put your house on a list for sale. You don't get the opportunity to show up to court and fight about it. Yeah, it's 30 days, 30 days notice of intent to accelerate, then notice of acceleration, 21 days, first Tuesday of the month, following that 21 days, you're done. That is aggressive. And I'm happy that we don't have that for the, the Pennsylvanians. But le so let me tell you, so the nuclear option in your scenario is going to occur far more often in Texas than it does in Pennsylvania. But what we're talking about here is chapter 13 bankruptcy. So what's great about bankruptcy is there's two, uh, two uh, chapters under the code for individual debtors. Chapter seven is for someone who just finds themselves, you know, if they're out of work for over a year and they find that they've had to turn to credit cards to pay their bills and support their family. And, you know, now they're back to work, maybe in a reduced capacity or reduced income. A chapter seven bankruptcy is fantastic. It's like hitting a reset button for your unsecured debt. It can eliminate your credit cards, your personal loans. If you want to keep your house, you can keep paying your mortgage and keep your home, or you can keep your vehicle by paying paying it and keep your vehicle, but it eliminates those unsecured debts. So that's what a lot of people think of when they hear about bankruptcy, but chapter 13 bankruptcy is where the real estate comes in. So if you're in Texas and you're, you get this default notice of intent to accelerate your mortgage and you're on track for the house being sold, you know, a week from now or a month from now, or even tomorrow, the power of filing a chapter 13 bankruptcy stops that foreclosure sale instantly. So a, a perfect example, and it just so happens to be this way, there are clients in my office right now that called us this morning because their house is for sale tomorrow. And one of my associates is downstairs meeting with them to file bankruptcy today so their house doesn't get sold tomorrow. That's what a chapter 13 does. Yeah. And that's the power of the bankruptcy court. So let me just explain what it is real quick. The easiest way to understand it is if you fall behind on your mortgage and you need to file a bankruptcy, let's say you, your payments are $1,000 a month and you've missed 15 payments. Now, I know you wouldn't get that far in Texas, but in Pennsylvania, you get that far. Wow. So let's say you missed 15 payments. Well, what the bankruptcy court lets you do is you file a bankruptcy and it separates those 15 missed payments into a separate payment plan for five years. So if you file bankruptcy today because you got your job back and you're ready to start making payments again, but you can't catch up $15,000, the court says, okay, well, Today is April, what is it? April 8th. So um, you start paying your mortgage May 1st, like nothing ever happened. And then at the same time, before May 8th, you get 30 days from the day you file bankruptcy, you start making a second payment towards those arrearages. So if your mortgage was $1,000 a month and you fell behind 15 payments, essentially you file bankruptcy and now you pay $1,250 a month your regular $1,000 mortgage plus an extra 250 because 250 a month for five years equals $15,000. So then after you're done with the five-year plan, you're right back on track and it goes back to $1,000 a month again. Now, as a, a citizen of this country or, or even a resident alien for that matter, uh, if you're a green card holder and you own property in this country, this is a right you have this right to file bankruptcy and do this and get back on track and keep your house. Very important. That's awesome. you know, there are some other things that we do prior to that. If you have more time, we can, you know, we can try to negotiate with the bank for a separate deal. And sometimes we get a better deal outside of bankruptcy than we do inside of bankruptcy. But at least with bankruptcy, you know, you always have that right to stop the sheriff sale. So we can negotiate for a week or a month or whatever. And if the bank's not going to cooperate and give you a, a loan modification or a better deal, you always have that last resort. Now I have a question and we've kind of, we've, we've spoken briefly about it because we, we know uh, each other in, in our attorney circles, but 
I have a question for those that go through the bankruptcy process. I've heard you guys talk about, you know, repeat offenders, the ones that come back. And I, I'm assuming this is a trend, you know, with all bankruptcy attorneys across the country. Do you have, you know, and, and it sounds like you're already a little bit different. How do you approach your client to help them not become a repeat offender? That is a great question, Kat. So uh, a couple of things. Uh, I sit down with them and have the conversation that we were talking about earlier about, about living within your means. You know, it, it blows my mind every day how many people don't balance a checkbook or how many people don't make a budget. You know, when you ask somebody, how much is your cell phone bill? They don't really know. Because a lot of people just, they have their direct deposit going into their account and Verizon or AT&T takes the money out and, oh, you know, around $100. Well, would it surprise you to know that it's now 215 because you weren't paying attention and there's these extra fees and blah, blah, blah. So one of the, the, the things that we do here at my office is make sure that we do a budget before and after the bankruptcy. So we look at what was going on before that caused this problem. And then we make another budget with what we should be doing in the future. And generally speaking, people who follow that budget and still have consistent income don't run into the problem again. However, it is unfortunate. There are folks that A, can't follow the budget or a lot of the repeat offenders or the repeat filers that I see is not as a result of their own demise, right? It's not something that they've done. They don't run up their credit cards, right? There's this belief that people that file bankruptcy are terrible people because they just went out and they spent all this money on their credit cards and they can't afford it and they should have known better and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, That exists, but that is a small percentage from what I see. That is a small percentage of the people that need bankruptcy help. You know who really needs bankruptcy help? People whose jobs close and get shipped overseas. People who are in an accident and they get workers' compensation, but workers' compensation isn't the same amount you were making before. And you know, if you're single and you get, you're on workers' compensation, maybe you can scale back your lifestyle. But guess what? Just because you're injured at home doesn't mean your wife and your three kids don't have to go to work and softball and eat and all of those things. So there are so many good people who uh, just find themselves jammed up through no fault of their own, like an accident or an injury at work or you know, a car accident or, or something of that nature. Right, right. And medical it sneaks up on you, medical bills, all of those oh, things. The medical bills are outrageous. Even if you have insurance, sometimes, you know, if you're in a car accident or, or you have an injury at work, those things are usually covered by you know, uh, your health insurance and then secondary auto insurance or workers' compensation insurance. But illness isn't right? Somebody has a heart attack, even if you have insurance, you can still walk away from the hospital with a $30,000 copay bill. Yeah. It's, uh, and that can be crushing to somebody who's got, you know, a, a family of four or a family of five living on one income, or maybe zero income, you know, depending upon how that illness has affected your family. Yeah. And I guess we're, we're seeing a lot of that now, you know, with, with COVID, you know, um, uh, you know, sadly I've shared with you a few, few of my, my friends have, have, have passed, uh, and just quick, you know, one, one friend of mine, 10 days, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's terrible. And, you know, like you said, the, the medical bills still, 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 uh, show up at, uh, right. at afterwards. It's like, oh yes, we're sorry for your loss. By the way, here's the $10,000 bill for, for, for the week. Uh, so yeah, that definitely is, is, is something that, that, you know, most, I, I agree with you. I, I don't think most people, uh, are gaming the system, trying to, to, to use bankruptcy to, to, you know, get, get out of, get out of jail free, so to speak. Uh, I think for the most part, it's, it's people who, who maybe were, were living, uh, on the edge, uh, and just one, one little, one little rock, you know, can, can knock them completely out of, out of kilter. Mike, most of our country lives paycheck to paycheck and those who don't live month to month. Um, you know, th there are very few people that have three, six, nine months worth of savings in the bank. And, and obviously even fewer that have a half a million dollars in the bank to fall back on. But there are very few families in this country, and I don't know the percentage, but I've heard the statistics and it's a really small uh, percentage of families that have 
six months worth of expenses in the bank that like it's it's a single digit percentage yeah right yeah yeah and it's it's not part of our culture to save and and plan for the future it's you know uh enjoy it now buy it with the joneses yep (laughs) so yeah all right. Well, let, let's let's move on to the to the to the next part of our of our uh, a podcast. Uh, and here's here's where we have our our guest share one of their uh, core values. And and I know you, and I know you have some some good core values. So why don't you share one of one of the one of your core values with us? Well, you know the the core value that I value most is it's the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So to me, that always is how I want to approach every conversation with the client, every court hearing, everything I do in life. You know, if I want to behave towards others, like I would want them to behave towards me. And I try to instill that in our office and we have conversations on a weekly, if not daily basis. You know, if anybody is thinking that we're helping somebody that doesn't deserve it or whatever the case may be, I I try to intervene and sit down and say, listen, everybody deserves this chance. Even if they have made mistakes in the past, they deserve this chance. We want to give them the same level of trust and professionalism and friendliness, you know, a a little bit of honey goes a long way in any conversation. Mm -hmm. And we we just really want to make sure that we are providing a level of service to our clients and our friends and our family, like they were friends and family, um, and just give them the same experience or better that we would expect when we go to another professional's office. That's great. And I'm sure that radiates also with your staff, you know, if they um, have that also, they're giving that you're receiving it. It's, it's, it's definitely, you know, it, like I said, it radiates with people. It, it does. And I can tell you, everybody knows you have a hard day at work, right? I, I'm not going to pretend that it's all rainbows and sunshine working here at the Laputka Law Office, but every job is that way. And, and you just have to you have to remember to be thankful. You know, I, I, I remind my staff frequently when they're dealing with a particularly difficult problem or a particularly difficult client that these clients are what give us a job helping these folks and the folks that they will refer and the folks that they will refer because we have a great attitude and we help everyone. Mm -hmm. That's what permits us to be employed and goes back to what we talked about, you know, 15 minutes ago, where this is why we get out of bed every day and come to work because we want to provide for our families. We want to, we want to serve people. We want to serve our community and we want to provide for our families by doing that. And, you know, you don't, you, you don't have to be a jerk (laughs) to be a lawyer. I I know that there's a a terrible misconception about a lot of us, but you don't have to be a jerk to be a good lawyer. And and frankly, I find that those uh, folks that I come across that operate in that uh, overly aggressive or jerky manner you know, they're really not doing themselves or their clients the service that they could be if they were you know, following the golden rule and just being polite and friendly and helping people instead of chastising them. Right. And, and you know, I, I, I can think of a few uh, of a few of those and, and you're absolutely right. And, and I think part of it, and just to, to, to go off into the woods for a second, like looking for my golf balls. Um, <laughs> Me too. It is, I think a lot of times these overly aggressive attorneys are, are really compensating for lack of knowledge uh, because they, their real tactic is I'm going to bully you until you give me what I want. And, you know, yeah, but the law doesn't say that. Yeah, but I don't care. You're going to, you know, I'm going to harass you until you give me what I want. And, and clients are, are, are at some point, they're going to be like, this is costing too much. What, what's, you know, what's it going to cost me to just give in as opposed to, you know, sticking to my guns and, and, and spending more money on attorney's fees because I'm right. You know, sometimes, you know, these, these bullies know 
that at some point your client's going to say, yeah, I don't, I don't want to spend any more money. Cause even if I win, I'm not, I'm, I'm still going to be upside down. Might as well give them something and maybe break even then to keep bleeding out. Right. And there's, there's a time and place for that. For example, you might want a strong bully of an attorney or, or pit bull of an attorney, so to speak, if you have a personal injury claim and you're going up against an aggressive insurance company, or if you're a criminal attorney and you're, you know, you're being wrongly accused for something, you might need somebody that's aggressive. But for the areas of law that you and I primarily practice, Mike, and many other attorneys, right? Because those criminal attorneys and those PI attorneys, that's a small percentage of, of the attorneys out there that are, are helping folks every day. For the kind of law that we practice, you're 100 percent Mike, right? Uh, right, Mike. That is not what. Uh, that's not what you want in an attorney. Yeah, yeah. And and so one one of the things I think is is you know neat about your practice and and you know like Kat said, we we know each other from 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 uh, our 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 consulting group, uh, but. Your your practice is, 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 is you are probably one of the highest filers in your area. Meaning meaning you 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 have a, a large market share, but yet because of this core value, uh, you keep getting repeat clients who who are happy with your service and how your staff treats them and and how you treat them. Because, you know, you're not treating them like the, you know, for lack of a better word, the bankruptcy mills that all they're doing is, is, you know, give me your name, give me your paperwork, we're going to get it filed. This is when you need to show up. Okay, this went through, here you go. Okay, you're done. Um, you know, that's it. You know, that, that's exactly right. And that, that comes back to those core values. And, and listen, I could do that. And I could make a whole lot more money if I had half the staff and we didn't return every phone call or answer every email and didn't spend the time that we want to spend. I could make my business more profitable. But that core value that we talked about, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, makes me have and, and directs me to have the appropriate amount of staff because that's a big deal here. There are a lot of law firms that are filing bankruptcy that have one or two attorneys and one or two staff. And they're trying to do a similar amount of volume that we're doing with 10 staff members. We've, we've got 10 people on staff here. And, and sometimes you just need to make sure that you are staffed appropriately so that you can deliver the level of customer service that your clients deserve. Right. right. And just to kind of um, wrap that up real quick, the reason why we ask people the core value is partially, if not in all part, because of the show, the solution point. And we really do think that uh, our core values and the ones that we've set out help us get to the answers that we want. Sometimes when you're in kind of like, well, um, should I do this? Should I not? Well, what's my core value? What is it? What am I putting you know, this up against? And I think that just in, in us sharing core values and we're gonna be making little snackable videos of this and we have our, our place list with just core values. It's important for people to know these things and start to address them and exercise them in their own family business, you know, whatever the case may be to help them come up with solutions. You know, cause sometimes you can be on the fence about something because you don't have a, a core value to put it up against. And one of the great things that, that that's very well said, and one of the great things about a core value is when you instill your core values in your employees, it helps them make decisions on the spot. Because just like you said, you can take a scenario and you can bounce it off your core value and, and it becomes easier to determine the answer with consistency and customer service forward every time. Right. Well, thank you, Charles. Always a pleasure, and we look forward to hopefully seeing you in our, our quarterly uh, seminars that we have with the Richard James Group, uh, our attorney there. consulting group. Uh, it's been fantastic uh, to grow our, our friendships nationally, and, and so glad that you could join us today. And on the motorcycle. We got to get back yes. on the motorcycles, Mike. All right. October. October 23rd. I'm looking forward to it.
All righty. Thank you. And uh, if you like the content, if you like the, the information you're getting, go ahead and hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, uh, give us a give <laughs> us a, a review. If you're on a on uh, if you're just listening to this on a podcast uh, grabber and uh, we'll see you next time uh, with uh, more solutions and core values. Bye-bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.